Tulsa, Oklahoma, hottest night of the year. Reservation radio coming in loud and clear. Well, the night wraps around us like a ninth generation blanket. Red tape tail lights shining bright. Two step and circle dance out late into the night. On the reservation radio, it was a reservation radio. What a reservation radio! What a reservation radio! Fathers. One was white and one was Indian. One worked on the railroad and one worked uh, uh, on the river, I think on uh, log pond. Mm -hmm. So where most, of the, most of the people on that side. But everybody, you know, in this neighborhood, do I, granddad came up from around Arcata, California mm -hmm. and uh, settled up on Cascade Head, and then was forced to move from there by the government, so they lived down in Neskowin for a while, and then came about a mile up the end of the road, uh, across the slough, settled there for some years, and then came to the place back here, built a house back here in 1928, I believe it was. And this was actually a goat shed. <laughs> this house, uh -huh. that part, and then after World War II, Uncle built this side, my, uh -huh. my father's twin brother, and so uh, my uncle uh, Robert and my dad Dick were twins, and uh, uh, at one point my mother was saying that, you know, that, that dad always wanted to be more Indian, he, he missed that connection apparently some sort of mental realm. And so they quite early on began going to Salettes mm -hmm. and, and hanging out with, with different people up there. And, of course, a lot of the Indians would pal together when they'd work on a job. They right. just lumped together right. um, for whatever reason. So over the years, my dad would go to Salettes. I had an aunt and uncle on my mother's side that lived out in Salettes. And so it was just kind of a natural thing, mm -hmm. you know, for them to be there. And so, consequently, I'm I'm just kind of at the tail end of a, a of a situation that's been going on for years and years and years. And that I go up to Celeste, it's much easier than driving all the way to Northern California. Yeah. I mean, you could work in the woods, or you could work on the water, or you could work on the railroad. Mm -hmm. And my my uh, grandpa and, uh, Elmer, who was my mother's father, my my white my white grandfather hung out with, with Archie Ben, who was like mm -hmm. the last speaker, I think, fluent speaker, or one of the last speakers, certainly, of, of uh, the Celeste language. My aunt, uh, story goes along, and I believe my aunt was the first woman in our family to get a college degree. Huh. And she this was, was your, your dad's sister? My dad's little mm -hmm. sister, mm -hmm. yeah. And she's up there today, behind. And... Uh, she got a degree to teach school, mm -hmm. and part of that, of course, was with art. And so 
Uh, it's about that time that my father died, that she was going to college, and I was five years old. So I spent some time with her up at the University of Washington. And then she would, you know, I'd get to play with paper mache, and mm -hmm. she would show me different things, and sort of. So through my aunt, I always, uh, through my aunt, it began, and through my mother and my stepfather, and the support later of my of my father's twin brother, my uncle. Through their love and support, why the art grew, and I was always told, you know, well, you know you're Indian, and the other part was, you're an artist. Artist Rick Bartow was born in 1946 in Yaquina Bay, just south of Newport, Oregon. Descended from the Mad River Band of the Wiat tribe, his paternal grandfather immigrated north in the 1920s. Bartow, as his close friends referred to him, was an internationally renowned visual artist and a wildly popular blues musician in the Newport scene. This program is a part of the Bartow Project, a collaboration of Del Arte International and the We Ought Tribe to celebrate the art and life of this incredible artist in his ancestral homeland. Leaving Tulsa, Oklahoma, hottest night of the year. Reservation radio coming in loud and clear. Well, the night wraps around us like an old Pendleton blanket. Red tape tail lights shining bright. Two step and circle dance out late into the night. And on a reservation radio, it was a reservation radio. In the previous clip, Bartow speaks with curator Rebecca Dopkins around the year 2000. Here, he continues in that same interview, describing the impact that his service in the Vietnam War had on his life. Bartow served as a teletype operator and as a musician in a military hospital tending to the wounded and dying. Yeah, the yeah. 70s, I think it was probably PTSD mm -hmm. from the word go, sure. um, coupled with, with alcoholism, and uh, I could probably have a lot more money than I have now if I'd been able to articulate what I was feeling. I could have <laughs> probably got a, you know, a veteran's uh, pension or something, mm -hmm. but it's never been my lot in life somehow, so I stumbled along and life got worse and worse and worse until uh, a fellow veteran got me into a, I think they called them encounter groups. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember Dr. those. Dr. Scott, I think. And, and it really, he pulled the rug right out from under mm -hmm. me and it showed me a direction, but I wasn't mm -hmm. able to pursue that direction for another 10 years, mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, into the 80s, things were still pretty horrible, and then, then finally uh, I got sick and I couldn't get well, and that scared me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know... Had you met Julie by this time? No. no. I, well, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I met her in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so I, uh, she was a musician, and, and I was dabbling with it as always, and so that's when I met her. And were you doing art at all during this time? Then? Oh, yeah. yeah. And it, it's never stopped, see, mm -hmm. no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, the, the trouble being, I would get drunk, and I would get something done, and then I would go out in the backyard and burn everything. And so some nights, you know, I'd just burn everything that was in the studio, including ashtrays and floorboards, if I could pry them up in just a drunken stupor. And wake up in the morning and just kind of think, well, there's that, now i got to do something else and start again. But, and I really don't know, you know, <laughs> if it wasn't a good thing to burn it up. I can't say at this point because yeah. it's gone, you know. Yeah. It, and it may be safe to say that, you know, it's, it, there was nothing there worth really keeping, except that I was working, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and I really have no idea what I burned out. Mm -hmm. None. I just know that I, a couple times I, I not only cleared the studio out, but kept the, took, 
took everything in the drawers that I had an old dresser that I put stuff in to keep and I burned all that too so it was gone um, that was in the 70s and the 80s I quit drinking and about the same time I quit drinking I started drawing purely as a therapeutic tool I certainly sold work had a garage sale and a and an art show um, to pay for Booker mm -hmm. my son and that mm -hmm. a little to uh, get enough money up to use a birthing room at the Oregon Health Sciences place. Uh -huh. Booker, Bartow's first child, was born in 1985 to him and his third wife, Julie Swan, who was a fellow musician and basket weaver. One of their closest friends, Sharon Taylor, remembers how important Julie's support was for Bartow's career. Julie encouraged Bartow to find representation with the William Jameson Gallery. Her focus before then was raising her little boy and backing up Bartow, keeping him able to work. Bartow was very, he was like gravity. They would come all the time, all these different people to his house, and he would stop his work to engage these people, and they would take up entire days of his time. And Julie, when she moved in with him, she's like, well, that's not going to go on. <laughs> she's like, I'm going to be your filter. Because people had done that with her, and she knew what it was like to not be able to focus on your art. So she created a bubble. He called her his bulldog. They had to go through her. And she was also the one who encouraged him to connect with um, William Jameson, the gallery where that's what made him was that connection. But in the beginning, he didn't think he could quit his daytime job. And they had a baby. And she's like, you can do this. You have to do this. So she really was his mojo. They were the love of each other's lives. I mean, well, the relationship went over 20 years. When they got together, they didn't need anyone else. They just, they cooked. You know, it was very magical. Big old heart goes on beating Where there's laughter, there is love Big old heart goes on beating In 1999, Bartow lost his wife, Julie Swan, to breast cancer and was unable to make any art for almost a year. Here he speaks to the difficult recovery process following that profound loss. And also, William, uh, something that I forgot in the last months, you know, is that William said, even if you've only got a dollar in your pocket, put on a good face and clean clothes and go out like you're successful mm -hmm. or you're not. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just that simple. And there have been times when everything was so shaken that I, I couldn't do that. You know, and I had no money and all I could do is say I had no money. And I, <laughs> I had, you know, I had to live off of, of my parents and off of my, you know, my girlfriend and, and uh, horrible things that I'd never had to do in 14 years in, in this business. I never had to do that. And then all of a sudden, Julie's gone, and my world caved in completely. And then I think about, just now I'm thinking about what William said. It's like my friend Drake said, it's kind of cyclic. It goes in cycles. But also, you know, many people have told me in the past, too, and, and Drake, uh, Technotel being one, that you have to put things into it to have things come out. And it's almost psychic. Bartow forged deep friendships with many artists of his generation. Here, he talks about his friend, Drake Decknatel, an abstract expressionist who was a part of the Seattle art scene, introducing him to artist Joe Federson, who in turn introduced Bartow to some of the most important contemporary Native artists of the Pacific Northwest. Joe Federson is a sculptor, painter, photographer, and mixed-media artist, and a member of the Colville Confederated Tribes. How did you um, get to know Lillian or... Joe well, or... Joe Joe was really the key. Uh, uh -huh. Deck Natel was the key to the door. Drake uh -huh. Deck Natel uh -huh. uh, said, I've got an Indian painter friend that you should meet. Uh -huh. And, of course, I was always horrified to meet people. I had bad teeth and bad breath probably mm -hmm. and was just, you know, I was ugly to myself mm -hmm. and didn't want to, mm -hmm. uh, no, no self-worth, no mm -hmm. self-confidence. doesn't leave you much ground to stand yeah. on when it comes to meeting new people. Yeah. And so I uh, dogged it to say, oh, yeah, well, okay, okay, you know, and then. One day Drake called and said, 
Hi, how you doing? And got me, got me all nice and loosened up and talking. And then he said, here's Joe Federson. And before I could say anything, he gave me Joe. And I always tease Joe and always talk about him and saying, you know, at that point he didn't know me and I didn't know him. And his total vocabulary was yes and no. You know, and so it just, I, I just sweat. I could barely hang on to the phone. I was sweating so much, you know, and, and hating Deck Nattel's guts for putting me on the line with this guy that I didn't even know. And and uh, uh, Joe said, you know, I, you know, I hear you, you know, you know, do really good work, and I'd like to see it. And I said, well, I don't have any pictures. I, I'm an alcoholic, you know. I'm a drunk, you know. And Joe would say something like, yeah, me too. But let's see your work. And <laughs> And I said, well, I have I only have two slides. And he said, so, you know, send the slides. And, oh, and then how about a statement? Well, I don't, you know, and God, I just excuse after excuse. And Joe just chew them up and spit them out. And just, he, and, you know, he's still that way. He just won't back up. You know, uh -huh. he just stays right there uh -huh. solid. I was doing 55. I know I was. You see, this the trouble. It wasn't a freeway. It was in the middle of the neighborhood. I'm barely guilty because I really slowed down. I pulled over by that city clown I'm barely guilty Bartow's art career eventually took him all over the world, to Japan, Australia, Germany, but his music playing kept him firmly grounded and connected with the Newport community. Leon Forrest played and recorded music with Bartow for 36 years. In the next clip, Leon talks about the two sides of Rick's creative work. The dichotomy between the solitary work of an artist like Rick, as opposed to the community work of someone like Reverend Bartow that I'd like to hold forth. There's this interesting thing about working with a lot of people as opposed to solitary work that you do in the wee dark hours. And I think it's that solitary work that brings your spirit to the fore. It's the work, the solitary work that we all have to do to learn what we are here for and what we are supposed to give to our fellows. And Rick was successful in, in both of those areas. Bartow always had a knack for connecting with young people and inviting them into his way of seeing. He often took time to speak to groups of youth explaining how it wasn't easy to get recognition as an artist. Here he speaks to youth at Newport High School, his own alma mater, in 2010. I, I, I'm sorry to take up time because I love listening to what you're doing, and I think that's absolutely what you should be doing. I wish that you had more time in the day to do these kind of things, to express yourselves and to prepare your voices for what's coming, because what's coming is pretty bland without your voice. People are waiting for your voice. People need to hear your voice. People need to see your words. They need to hear your words. They need to hear your music. They need to hear what you have to say. Yeah. They don't even know it, but they need it. It's plain and simple. You have something very vital to say, and it's not being heard by very many people. <coughs> because every time you say, oh, it's not important, it goes down a little bit. It goes down a little bit. I came from this school. I was an average student, probably voted least likely to succeed, class clown. And yet, everyone around me knew what I was, but I was an alcoholic, and first I had to overcome alcohol and drugs. I speak like you speak. I have no fancy education. I went to college, went to a little teacher's college, graduated average, had to brown nose the the mathematics teacher to pass me with a D so I could graduate. Nothing special, but I had art here in my heart, in what they call a sacred and holy place. And each of you has it, whether you realize it or not, you have something to give. And for you who have art and music and writing and poetry within you, you have to struggle with it. 
You have to carry it because there are people waiting, because there are many, 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 many people your age and in around your age who are waiting to hear your voice. You, in our way, in a native way, you have a sacred job to do. As a performer, that's your gift, and you have a sacred job to perform. You have a sacred job to express yourself. Because every time you express yourself, there's someone who cannot, and they'll need you. They'll need your voice to speak for them. Enough, huh? <laughs> That song was given to Bartow by a man named Buell Anakak, or Two Raven Man, and it is an honor song that Bartow shared on many special occasions. One such occasion was at an event for the opening of his first major retrospective in 2015, less than a year before his death. We Ought Tribal Chair Ted Hernandez was in the audience and spoke about meeting Rick at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Uh, you know, I have a couple of stories myself. And I think the best one is when we went to the Smithsonian and Rick asked us to do a brush dance there. So we went up there with me and my youngest dancers. And when we got there, we saw Rick and I said, Rick, you're going to dance. He goes, but I don't know how. I go, don't worry about it, it comes natural. And I was surprised because he got dressed with us guys and we all got dressed. And it takes a while to get ceremonial dress for Galleon. And we got Rick on, you know, all dressed up. And it, so most of you been to the Smithsonian, that floor is hard. I mean, it's a hard floor to dance on. So we got out there and we started dancing. And then we all looked, all my guys looked at Rick and said, is he going to jump? Is he going to jump center? Because this is a brush dance. It's a, it's a dance for healing a child. And so we're all looking at Rick, and next thing you know, here comes Rick. He starts jumping center. And then my youngest guys get out there and start jumping with him. And it was, a, it, was, it was a privilege to see my youngest dancer, who was at the time six, and our oldest elder dancer dancing at the same time. It was an experience. And then we got to real close, and Rick adopted me into his family, my family adopted Rick, so that's why we call him our uncle. You know, I respect. Bartow reconnected strongly with his ancestral people, the Wiat tribe, eventually dancing with them in the first world renewal ceremony held in 154 years in 2014 on Talawad Island in Humboldt Bay. But the event in 2015 at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art featured a panel of some of Bartow's closest artist friends, like writer Barry Lopez and ceramicist Lillian Pitt, who shared anecdotes of Bartow. It was no secret that Bartow was suffering from congestive heart failure, and the mood in the room was reverential. When the speakers were done, Bartow honored them in return, in his own special way. <laughs> To the north, to the east, to the south, to the west, above, below us, 
all around, everywhere. Say thank you in that way that was taught. Tobacco, not to smoke for the Creator. In a certain way, then it seemed to pray. To say thank you to all these people who've told very lovely lies. <laughs> Please, forgive them. They're just having fun. I have a big, what her grandfather used to say, you had a big shirt and a little head. <laughs> and as my friends, as we talk about the birds, the little bird sound takes our prayer. My uncle used to love to tell me that I was like a baby bird, all mouth and full of poop. <laughs> so my friends, my little bird friends, This program is a part of the Bartow Project, featuring four short films by Native filmmakers about the art and life of Rick Bartow, and screening across ancestral Weout lands throughout April 2022. Go to thebartowproject.com for information and tickets. The Bartow Project is a collaboration between Del Arte International and the Weout Tribe, produced by Michelle Hernandez and myself, Zuska Sabata and supported by the California Arts Council, National Endowment for the Arts, and the James Irvine Foundation. Big old heart like a red This podcast was produced by myself, Zuska Sabata, and Nate Dog. Special thanks to Access Humboldt, Sharon and Sonia Taylor, Rebecca Dopkins and the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art Archives, Leon Forrest, and Nanette Kelly. Music is by Rick Bartow, performed by Rick Bartow, and Black Belt Eagle Scout, courtesy of Saddle Creek. <laughs>